Hello everyone, Kevin Costola here. It's really good to be back with you. We're kicking off another season of the Unauthorized Disclosure podcast. And last year we talked and Rania and I decided that uh, it would be okay if Unauthorized Disclosure became more of a kind of weekly show uh, that I could put together and bring on people for interviews, uh, that it would be primarily my show for you know, quite a long time, two, three years, I've been producing Unauthorized Disclosure, doing a lot of the booking of guests, uh, trying to keep it going, editing the shows, posting it online and making sure that everybody has access because Rania has been focused on her work through the Breakthrough News, uh, her gig as a host for, for the Freedom Side, also putting out dispatches regularly. And so the last two or three years, a struggle has been keeping unauthorized disclosure going while she has all that work to do. And she's been, been very kind to, to keep a connection with me and continue to collaborate on this podcast. But going forward, you probably can expect to see her you know, once a month, maybe twice a month at most. So I'm mixing in some guest, guests here and there. Uh, for this first show of the year, we've got Matthew Ho, who is returning, has been on Unauthorized Disclosure before. Uh, but as uh, we go through 2024, I'm going to do the best that I can to expand the guest list, uh, try to reach out to some new people. I'm hoping that I can find some new voices to get in here on Unauthorized Disclosure while mixing in some of the favorites that I have liked to turn to for their insights and expertise. But thank you for being here. Thanks for your support of the Unauthorized Disclosure Show. If you're hearing this part of the episode, you're a subscriber, you're a patron, you're somebody who believes in this little show. And I thank you for supporting this show. Uh, and also your contribution means that I can continue to do the journalism that I do. And uh, professionally, personally, last year was a big year. I'm now a father. And uh, so as I look at 2024 and I think of everything, uh, I'm, I'm prepared to fail. I know that failure is probably around the corner. I know that I'm an ambitious person. There's going to be a lot that I try to do. I know that there might be some weeks here and there where I intend to produce a show for you. And it just doesn't happen. It doesn't come together. Uh, but I do intend for this to be a weekly show. There's, there's what, 52 weeks out of the year. I, I promise you that there will be somewhere around 40, 35 to 40 episodes a year if you're willing to support uh, this show. And so I'm not wasting your time and uh, I want to engage with you. So if there's something that makes you want to subscribe or be a patron of the show, that's important to me. And there are probably our guests or topics you would like to see this show dig into. And if there's something you think that uh, unauthorized disclosure is uniquely suited to do, you know, let us know. Uh, send a message to the Patreon or send a message to uh, the dissenter email. Uh, it's a newsletter at the dissenter.org. Uh, we're posting the show over at the dissenter. I have made a foray into writing about film. And so sometimes maybe I'll bring that into the show as I do these interviews and as I, as I talk. I had this idea that I'd be able to be a dad and also do broadcasting on YouTube, be doing live streams, posting videos and having the kinds of shows that I, I did back in 2023 or I tried to stand up the YouTube channel back in 2023. Uh, because I thought doing that would help get unauthorized disclosure, some more views, some more attention for the guests that are willing to come on and be interviewed. I just don't know that I'm going to be able to do that work. I'm finding it a lot easier to do writing, to keep up the dissenter newsletter where this podcast has its home and to keep up the work on whistleblowing and freedom of the press and covering Julian Assange's case. Uh, and then using unauthorized disclosure to get into some of the issues of war and foreign policy that I like to pay close attention. 
and of course, I can't ignore what's happening in Gaza and that's part of why I reached out to Matthew Ho as we're seeing the war over there uh, spill over and expand and, and the U.S. is becoming involved in, in a conflict that is ensnaring more and more players um, and that it is our responsibility. We are escalating. We are allowing the Middle East to become more of a hotbed of violence because of uh, the fact that we are launching these military actions against these groups, particularly groups that are standing up for Palestinians. Um, so thank you for tuning in. Uh, we'll get to the interview now. And uh, going forward week after week, uh, I'll have a little bit of commentary for you for a few minutes before we start the show. Oh, need to let you know this, that uh, Sundance Film Festival was this past week. I decided that I wanted to buy some online tickets and review some movies that are premiering there. And I think you're going to be interested in the review that I'll be posting on a film called Soundtrack to a Coup d'etat. And uh, it's about the uh, coup against Patrice Lumumba in the Congo. And uh, the documentary filmmaker behind it, also somebody who did Shadow World, which was about the arms trade and the, uh, the flow of weapons uh, between countries and arms trafficking. And I think to a certain degree, how the U.S. is implicated or involved in some of that. So uh, this is somebody who's really good at this work and I'm looking forward to watch this two and a half hour film and I'll be posting a review and hopefully getting it some more attention because this is kind of movie film making that I like to get people engaged with. All right, uh, on to the interview with Matthew Ho and the next week, Rania will be here and we'll be doing a show, um, you know, a classic uh, episode where we sit down and talk to each other about some of the news and stories from the past week, catch up with each other. I haven't had a chance to talk with her since I talked with her in December. Uh, a lot's been going on. Um, and so I can't wait to sit down and catch up with her in the new year. Until then, here's the interview with Matthew Ho. Welcome to this interview. I'm pleased to be joined by Matthew Ho, who is the associate director of the Eisenhower Media Network. He's also a former Marine, um, formerly worked for the State Department, someone with a lot of expertise on U.S. foreign policy and military affairs. I'm pleased to have him back to have a discussion this week. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for having me back on. And uh, so uh, I just want to begin, uh, you know, very specifically here uh, by discussing the threat that we see unfolding of of regional conflict, of the fact that it's what started with the Israeli government's response to uh, the October 7th attack by Hamas, or the uh, however you want to describe it, uh, that now there are all these other players in the Middle East that are taking roles and, and choosing to take acts militarily or to defend their territory, or whatever their agendas might be. There's a whole stew of different things happening. And I actually think Joe Biden anticipated this. Uh, people might forget, but he did say after October 7th that he was fearful that this might turn into something like 9-11. Um, mm -hmm. And that's seemingly been forgotten, but I wanted to point out something um, worse uh, that has circulated. I want to play this. I, I know that you've seen this clip. Are the airstrikes in Yemen working? Well, when you say working, are they stopping the Houthis? No. Are they going to continue? Yes. You know, he, he's asked directly, and he gives this great distillation of U.S. foreign policy. So my broad question as we begin to get into a lot of different specific issues is to just say, you know, and a lot of other experts and people who talk about these issues have felt similarly. 
isn't this just a great representation of U.S. foreign policy over the last 20 to 25 years? It, it, it's not working, but we're going to just keep doing it. I, I think so. I mean, I, I, it's, uh, um, I think the, the thing that was dominated so many of our responses is that we weren't shocked. We weren't running around screaming, you know, I can't believe he said this. It, it was kind of like, yeah, he said this. He said, he said what, what is the reality of American foreign policy or militarized foreign policy. Um, I mean, there's a lot of ways you can look at kind of break apart uh, his, his understanding of it. I mean, this is what empires do. You know, em empires have to act punitively. Empires have to defend their interests, including the interests of their vassals. Uh, that um, there is so much of this is related to domestic American politics, where if I don't do something, Lindsey Graham is going to go on, meet the press and attack me. Right. I mean, so th there's all these different factors that uh, create the ra reality that we are dealing with. You know, and we, we see the reality that the United States had to respond again because of the empire. And that's what empires do. I'm sorry, I can't give a more complicated uh, answer than that, because I think it's just that simple. But then there are other aspects, too, you can look at and say, well, you know, the, the Israeli economy is really suffering uh, since October. And this blockade of their southern port, their Red Sea port was having a big impact and would have a greater impact, as well as the effect that it would have globally, it would have effect on commerce. It's costing people money. And the people that's costing money have, are friends with the people in the White House. You know, there's all those types of things. So um, I think when you, when you step back from it, though, uh, you know, the, the fact that he said this, at least I think maybe some of us are like, well, at least we're, at least we can have this rational conversation now. You know, at least we don't have this, uh, these lies, this hyperbole, uh, these fairy tales uh, that we have to cut through and deal with and have to talk about before we can get to the substance of what's occurring here. So in this way, I think the president did a lot of us a favor. Yeah. And uh, let me put up the confirmation that we're getting from within the Biden White House of, of where this might go as far as countering this blockade that He's Yemeni. I mean, we say Houthis, it's pejorative label. And unfortunately, I'm a Westerner. I don't yeah. actually. Do, do you know the real name for this group? It's apparently. Yeah. yeah, yeah. OK, yeah. yeah. But so, it, I mean, I feel that that has not been used at yeah. all uh, in the West since November. Uh, I mean, I probably if you would ask me November, what's their name? I probably would have to look it up. And I'm uh -huh. someone who has paid attention to Yemen much more than many other people have, right? You know, I'm certainly not an expert on it, but that has been the usage. Uh, Houthis has been the colloquial usage for them for, you know, for the for the 10 years or so that we've been talking about Yemen and, and the war there and everything else. Yeah. But yeah, but certainly it's, I think it's, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to, to, to do it, but it's, it's difficult to, to change sometimes. Well, right, because if I say that group, nobody's going to know right. what I'm talking about. So, so we have we have that barrier, but that's often uh, the the thing with colonialism. So I, I've been Kevin. I've been just saying uh, Yemenis rather than saying other yeah. who are on a lot because they, they they are they are the 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 power in for most of Yemen. Eighty percent of the population uh, lives under their government, and while there is frac factions and and breaks within that population within that constituency, they don't have universal support. They have what we would term popular support. And particularly since November, they have had a great more degree of popular support from their constituency, which again is 80%. So I mean, in, in any sane discussion of this, right, which, uh, you know, is not the way the Western media works, we would be describing them as the Yemeni government. Yeah. But rather the Yemeni government are these puppets that live in Riyadh, they don't even live in Yemen, they're described as the, because the whole thing is our, our understanding is so corrupted uh, by the view and the narrative that is being trying to use to shape our understanding of what's occurring there and has been that way for, for decades now. We launched the first missile strike. People have to remember, first American missile strike in Yemen was in 2002. And then according to John Kiriakou, there were other strikes that were never acknowledged. Uh, and then, of course, you had under the Obama administration starting in 2009, uh, a great deal, many more 
missile strikes. And then, of course, with the, the war in 2015, involvement's been, been high on, on different levels. Yeah. And so let me put up the news uh, that this came from a reporter who now works for the Washington Post. And, and this is, you know, what I want to attend to is the Biden administration is crafting plans for a sustained military campaign against uh, I'm going to say Yemenis, after 10 days of strikes have failed to halt their attacks, they're stoking concern among some officials that an open-ended operation could derail Yemen's uh, fragile peace. I don't know if they really have had peace, but anyways, the pull, pull and could pull the U.S. into another conflict. Of course, the U.S. has been backing bombing in Yemen. But, uh, sorry, I'm fact-checking this. Yeah, and, and there has been a and there has been a, a peace, uh, not a perfect peace, but certainly in the last two years, you've seen a great reduction in violence. You've mm. not seen the lifting of a of a uh, of the blockade, sanctions, embargo in the manner I think that a lot of, a lot of people wanted to see, and certainly you've not gotten to the core issues that define that war. Uh, but the degree of violence that the Yemeni people have endured, and the amount of aid that's been able to get to those people is much greater, I mean, it's certainly a big difference than it was two years ago. And so it, it is a piece worth saving. It's also very, uh, I think it's important to note how the Emiratis and the Saudis who were waging war in Yemen since 2015 um, are approaching this conflict in the Red Sea, approaching the American and British attacks. You would think that someone who had been fighting with someone for nine years would jump at the chance that the American military is now going to fully engage against their enemy, and they're not. They're, but it's more complicated than that because, you know, the United States military operates from Saudi Arabia and the Emiratis, and they operate from, excuse me, Bahrain and Qatar and, and, and you know, uh, Jordan, uh, Turkey, uh, uh, Djibouti, uh, all throughout the region. I think there's only two or three nations that we don't have troops in the Middle East. You know, I think it's it's really Iran and Lebanon is debatable because there, I believe there, there's some documentation that we've have special operations forces there. So, I mean, when you look at where do we, and then Yemen, of course. So how complicated this all is. And so, yeah, these nations aren't taking part with the American attacks on Yemen. They're not taking part in that uh, fleet in the Red Sea, the, the US, UK fleet in the Red Sea. Uh, but they are allowing all these operations to come from their lands, right? So it, mm -hmm. it's, it's nothing is really black and white here. Uh, and then the, the, the second thing in the line here from this reporter is that officials are saying they don't expect the operation will stretch on for years like previous U.S. wars in Iraq or Afghanistan. At the same time, they acknowledge they can identify no end date or provide an estimate for when, and I'll say Yemeni capabilities will be adequately diminished like they're basically saying outright that they are embarking on an open-ended conflict and all wars at this moment in history in my lifetime that i can remember paying attention everything that we've ever started has been open-ended right right and, and the phrase that they use very often they the, the american empire basically uses is conditions based just saw this because there's a push by the Iraqis to get the Americans out of Iraq. We have 2,500 troops in Iraq and about five or 6,000 contractors probably. And those troops have been there more or less since 2003. And uh, the Iraqis, particularly after these last couple of months, these last several months of American support for Israel's genocide, but then also to the American air attacks within Iraq uh, that have killed uh, some civilians, but also members of uh, Shia popular mobilization forces uh, that are, to say closely aligned with those in power in Baghdad would be kind of an understatement. But so they're upset that their allies, their friends have been killed by the Americans and airstrikes. They don't want to see this violence in their country. They're trying to recover from decades of it. They know the Americans to be a problem. They're trying to get them out. And so as talks are undergoing with that, you see the same phrase coming from the Americans that you see for all these other wars, all these other occupations, conditions based, you know, and they never really say what the conditions are. If they do, it's so uh, nebulous uh, that, you know, so vague that it's meaningless. Uh, and it just allows for this permanent presence for allows for permanent occupation and it allows for forever war.
And one more detail I want to point to is what we've seen, and we're recording this on January 25th, uh, but we're seeing in the last 24 hours that a shipping company, Maersk, is saying that explosions nearby forced two ships operated by its U.S. subsidiary and carrying U.S. military supplies to turn around when they were transiting the Bab al-Mandab Strait off Yemen. And that's uh, and they were accompanied by the U.S. Navy. Um, right. And so I just want to work in here. I don't know if you've observed this. I, I, I'm interested in your response to it. But there's been an effort to fudge what is actually going on to make it murky what what is really going on what we're talking about here with the yemenis is that they mounted a blockade in 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 protest uh basically to show solidarity for uh gaza and to oppose the further arming of the israeli military so that they can continue these genocidal operations and um you know it's been said that what the U.S. is countering is, oh, no, we're not doing this because they're standing up for Gaza. We're going after them because they're endangering the lives of people. But they're actually only blocking ships or going after ships that they believe are going to engage in crimes against humanity or war crimes. Um, and, you know, in their view, they believe they are upholding international law by taking these steps. Uh, and they're not attacking Chinese ships, and they're not attacking Russian ships. And that actually has made U.S. officials apoplectic because they think that, you know, it's wrong for this group, I guess, to be like singling out them for these shipments that are going to Israel. Uh, but it also, I think it bothers them because it shows that the Yemenis are being discerning in the way that they are mounting these operations. And it makes it harder for them to present them as like, mass murderers right. in the Middle East. Right. Particularly as far as I know, no one's been hurt in their attacks. Now that just that should just be luck. That's just the, the fact that their missiles are not that accurate. The US Navy shot down a lot of them. So certainly someone could have been hurt or killed, but no one's been hurt or killed so far in their attacks. The worst thing that's happened, of course, is crew members have been taken uh from some of the ships. And as far as I know, they're still being held. Uh, though whether that's an issue of they're being held because they want to hold them or just because they've got no way to send these people back to where they need to go, you know, so I, I don't know. But uh, the contortions that the White House, the Pentagon, the State Department are putting themselves through, putting us through having to listen to them about how this is not connected to Israel, how the war in Gaza is contained to Gaza uh, is it, just, you know, this is why I think many of us were happy with Joe Biden saying, no, it's not going to work. We're going to do it. We're going to do it anyway. Because at least being honest, at least it's being straightforward. You don't have to deal with this Orwellian uh, discourse uh, that is just so upside down. Uh, you know, so in this, but this is the problem, Kevin, that we have to really grapple with is that these things that are said, that the what's happening in the Red Sea is not connected to what's happening in Gaza. These articles of faith put forward by the White House, the State Department, Pentagon. The problem is, I can tell you this from experience, uh, and other guys who were in these positions, other guys and gals can tell you the same thing too. That type of narrative, those articles of faith, those that, that truth isn't just for external use. It's for internal use as well. And whether that's purposeful or not, whether that's meant to be or it's accidental, whether it's it's that's just the, the reality of what occurs, it doesn't matter because that's what does occur. So what do you have at happening at the Pentagon? What do you have happening at the State Department, at the NSC, you know, at the CIA right now, where you know the reality is that what's happening in the Red Sea is not connected to Gaza. Go ahead and put forward a plan that's gonna fix it. Nope, nope, it's not, you can't do anything about, can't mention Gaza at all. You can't mention the Palestinians, the Israelis, it has nothing to do with that. Figure out a plan how to address this, right? And we saw that. I mean, I saw that, uh, you, know, you know, my when I was on the Iraq desk at the State Department in 05 and 06, I go to these interagency meetings, uh, you know, about Iraq. Uh, and there'd be representatives from all across the government, and including the office of the vice president. And these, this was basically at about two, two or three levels below the principles. Okay, so the, this, this is the working groups really that kind of put put on paper what's going to be the policies, and then that gets advanced up, uh, you know, up the ladder. 
And, but the way that at that point in 2005, 2006, you could not refer to what we were doing in Iraq as an occupation was one of those statements of truth that covered everything. And if you did, you got your hand slapped and people would enforce it. And so what type of policy is going to come out of that? You know, okay, we got to figure out how to, at that point we were working on, you know, my great shame. I worked on this, you know, it's an embarrassment, but it's also a lot of sincere regret. Uh, what was called the national strategy for victory in Iraq, right? How are you going to put together a national strategy for victory in Iraq when you can't even utter the word occupation, right? I mean, so it, it, that, is that type of thinking occurring here? I, I, I believe it probably is, you know? So why do we think that anything, why would anyone think uh, that what's going to occur with regards to Yemen is just not going to, it's just going to be the same thing, but somewhat, you know, a little different, a little dissimilar, looks a little different, sounds a little different, but it's the same, same thing as we've seen in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, uh, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Somalia, all throughout Africa. Uh, you know, we could, we could be here all day talking about that, but because that's the way the culture works within these institutions. Um, and it, it, and this is why we end up with these types of scenarios where, the U.S. Navy is going to go into the Red Sea and we're going to protect shipping. And we've been doing that. U.S. Navy has been doing that for about two or three weeks now. And, and as people have been saying, there's less shipping traffic now than when the U.S. Navy went in there to protect people. After what happened with those two Maersk uh, container ships, uh, Maersk uh, said uh, yesterday or this morning, none of, no more of our ships are going through the Red Sea. So now mm -hmm. there's you know, one more massive shipping firm is saying we're not going in there. You know, uh, yeah. so it, 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 it's how counterproductive it is, let alone how failing it's going to be, is something that is bound to happen when you you can't even speak the truth of the situation when you're in these circles that are deciding what's going to be done. So before I play a couple of clips of the discourse or the Orwellian speak that we're getting from the spokespersons for this administration, uh, I'll treat them broadly, but uh, what's your biggest fear about what we're seeing? I mean, over in the, I think it's pointed out that in the last week, we've seen U.S. military strikes in at least a half dozen countries, I think, like, or against at least half dozen groups that have relationships or are, are based in, in countries that could get pulled deeper into this mm -hmm. conflict. I mean, we're provoking Iran. We, um, and of course, at the same time that we're doing everything we're doing in the Middle East, Biden is continuing operations in Somalia with strikes against Al-Shabaab. And I believe that the world is watching the U.S. as it supports genocide. And they're watching the military in this empire as they seem to be willy-nilly dipping their toes into these different uh, skirmishes and uh, different back and forth military fights that are happening. And, and they're, they're just adding to the violence and also facilitating it. So what's your biggest fear about what you see going on? And, and is there even a policy behind this or are there just people sitting behind a desk making like a cost benefit analysis about what they can get away with and what they can't? I, I think a lot of it is the inertia of it. Again, this is what empires do. This is, you know, and so at best, I think what we see is this uh, gunboat diplomacy, if you will, this idea that we have to have our forces in the, in the Middle East, uh, even, you know, in order to, 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 to civilize uh, those regions, to make it safe for commerce uh, you know, to, 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 to keep the barbarians in their place. That's why a couple of weeks ago you saw on Twitter, you know, all these uh, David Frum types uh, and Jeffrey Goldberg types bringing up how Thomas Jefferson sent the Navy uh, to battle the Barbary pilot, pirates in 1805, right? I mean, reaching back 200 plus years to find some kind of justification for what was occurring. I mean, it's completely ridiculous. But, um, you know, I, I think that's at best what we'll see. And this tit for tat kind of, we blow up some things, some more missiles are fired at us. I think eventually you'll have American uh, service members uh, wounded or killed. And the Biden administration will have to face Lindsey Graham on Meet the Press saying they're betraying our troops. They're too weak to stand up to, 
you know, the, the Ayatollah, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Donald Trump uh, will, of course, use this for everything he can. And so a year from now, if Trump's in office, my fear is a lot different than what it is, because I don't believe the Biden White House wants a war with Iran. I, I don't think they do at all. Uh, they they want to their efforts against Iran have been just uh, reactionary, trying to make it so that they don't lose any of the uh, conservatives that they think they're going to get who are going to vote for them rather than Trump. So they want to placate that type of, of neoconservative crowd. And so that's why you didn't see the administration roll back, uh, you know, the maximum pressure campaign of the Trump administration that was, you know, what was, you know, this, this, particularly these, these really tough and brutal sanctions. I think my, my bigger, biggest fear is not immediate, it's more long term. Does what we're seeing here, um, and this particularly relates to Israel, does this push the Turks to get a nuclear weapon? Does this put the Egyptians to get a nuclear weapon? Does, you know, as you have this fracturing of the unipolar world, which again, something last couple of years, a lot of people have liked to discuss, which is which they, we should be, but there's a lot of dangers to it. And one of those is, you know, if you're Turkey or you're Egypt or you're Saudi Arabia and you see what's happening in Gaza, you are powerless to really intervene because the Israelis have nuclear weapons anywhere from between 100 and 600 of them, depending on the estimate you look at. And they have, you know, they have a pretty clear policy that they will use them. So will you sacrifice uh, Ankara uh, to attack Israel kind of thing? Uh, no. And so, but if you have that parity, if you have nuclear parity, then, then now is it possible for the Turks to intervene? Uh, and I, that's my fear is that what ha is occurring here won't have immediate effects, will have longer term effects because nations are going to want to be able to operate more independently. And, you know, my sympathies are with the Turks in this situation. I'm not bad mouthing the Turks, but my, my concerns are that uh, as this world order fractures, as the American hegemony falls apart, the consequences of that could be very grave so that you could see conventional wars in the Middle East where you would not have before if nuclear parity is achieved. And that, of course, would be catastrophic in a way that, say, things do get out of hand. And just because I said the Biden administration doesn't want war in Iran, I don't think the Iranian government wants war with the U.S. There certainly are hardliners in the Iranian government to do, just like we have our, uh, you know, just like we have our Lindsey Graham and Tom Cotton's and the ghosts of John McCain. You know, I mean, so, uh, you know, th there is always that possibility. And the more that you have this type, these, these, this, this warfare, the more that you have this conflict, the more they have this confrontation, the likelihood of that is much, much greater, of course. But my fears are more long term in the sense of as the United States tries to control its empire, right, as it feels it's swiftly losing it, its grasp is causing it to fracture. And that fracturing can have consequences that, yeah, trust me, I want to see the American empire go away as much as anybody does. But the dangers that could come from that dissolution are really great unless we have some type of international structures, international institutions that can help guide and help replace what the American empire is, is, is leaving and it's leaving you know, wreckage. But what can be done to ensure that you're not going into uh, this type of future world order where um, you know, nations I feel like they have to act independently for their own survival. Importantly, you're you're raising nuclear weapons, and often our conversations, even like looking into the future, this doesn't even pop up in our discussion of what's uh, facing us, uh, the types of catastrophes that could unfold. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning that a group that manages the doomsday clock, the Bulletin mm -hmm. of Atomic Sci Scientists this past week, kept the clock at 90 seconds to midnight. It was that close last year. It's still this close this year. They have not seen any changes. And they track not just nuclear weapons, and it used to be their main focus, but they've incorporated climate change and disruptive technology like AI and uh, whether people are keeping uh, things that could start pandemics secure. So like they do biosecurity. 
But we'll leave that out just for now and stay here on the nuclear weapons. The thing is that between China, Russia, and the United States, they point out all of these countries have made it public that they are modernizing their nuclear arsenals. And that is troubling to them as they look at this. And then while that is unfolding, you also see these different countries here and there that are making pushes to develop and enrich uh, you know, uranium so that they can have their own nuclear weapons. And I don't think there's any appreciation when you look at the wars that are being made and started uh, what could happen at any given time with these groups if they do decide to deploy nuclear weapons? Yeah, you know, it, it is the danger of it uh, is, is uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's accurate what the bulletin of atomic scientists are saying, you know, how we live this close to the end of it all. Um, it, it is, uh, it, it is something again, is, this is another reality of our, of our own construction. Um, you know, and, and it's not impossible to see how nuclear confrontation, nuclear war could very easily begin. And one thing we have to remember is we have generals and admirals, we have policy wonks and think tank residents and members of Congress, people who go on CNN and MSNBC, you know, these pundits uh, who say, who use the term usable nuclear weapons. I mean, that is something that people believe in. People believe that you can fight a limited nuclear war. People believe in the veracity and the validity of having these low-grade nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons, as they're called, that could be utilized in a manner that could be controlled and be, could be contained. Um, you know, there's this folly of this these theories of escalate to de-escalate, all this nonsense when, you know, um, the, the truth of the matter is, escalation theory for decades has shown that it just goes one way and that these confrontations in all the war games, a colleague of mine, Larry Wilkerson, uh, former chief of staff to Colin Powell, he still participates in a lot of different war games and things with the Pentagon and state, state department. And Larry, I tell you, every time we have a war game with the, with where it's the U S versus China, it almost always escalates to nuclear war. And most of the time it's the U S side that's saying we're going to use a nuclear weapon. And so this idea that imagine, you know, you might not think the Biden administration would do it. I don't know. I mean, these are also the same people that are describing genocide as self-defense. So maybe they, a, a tactical nuclear weapon is, gets described as an enhanced conventional munition, right? I mean, like these are also the same people who believe that enhanced interrogation, torture was not torture. It was enhanced interrogation. I mean, so again, we're talking about a lot of our conversation, Kevin, has been about the Orwellian nature of language and how that, you know, as in Orwell's book, you know, that defines reality. You know, it's just not it's just not a public relations draping. It's just not spin for the media. It's meant to control people. It's meant to define the reality of a society. And so, you know, our smallest nuclear weapon is 0.3. Uh, it's 0.3 uh, kilotons. The Hiroshima bomb was 15 kilotons. So you can see just the difference in the size of those weapons. Incidentally, the Hiroshima bomb, which destroyed the city as well as, as, as the Nagasaki bomb, which was 20 kilotons, uh, those would be considered by the standards of the day now as tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, so when you hear that term, that means bombs that can destroy entire cities. You know, it goes all the way up to 50 kilotons, I think. You know, so a bomb five times, you know, or bombs three or four times greater than the Hiroshima bombs are still considered tactical nuclear weapons. So that's the type of insanity that we're dealing with here, right? That's the type of word speed. That's the type of, 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 of uh, uh, wordsmithing that we are subjected to because that's because that dominates our policy that informs our policy and that's what our decision makers are presented with and that's also how they think so can you imagine uh, circumstances uh happening in say ukraine where the ukrainian army collapses uh and russia pushes through that gap uh, they exploit that collapse and they are pushing towards kiev and there's a fear that they're pushing towards uh the western western parts of ukraine uh, you know, two thoughts. One, would the Romanians and Romanians and Poles then go in to create a buffer against Russia, as well as uh, take land that many of them also want? And that's a long history. People aren't familiar with uh, the different borders that have existed in that part of the world for a very long time. Uh, but you know, this idea that the Americans would would say, 
uh, you know, would say to Joe Biden or would say to Donald Trump, look, we can use this weapon. It's 0.3 kilotons. I mean, that is uh, what uh, I, I can't even do the math in my head, but the Hiroshima bomb was 15 kilotons. So this is such an order of magnitude less. We shouldn't even call it a nuclear weapon. It really is a big conventional weapon. You know, the Israelis dropped more bombs in, in Gaza than what we did on Hiroshima, you know, by far. So this whole, this whole, you know, you can see that type of language being utilized to, to make a, an argument here that, okay, we're going to use this. And so you can see how, how those weapons could be used. This is not, you know, something that could not happen. And certainly against a power that doesn't have those weapons. And we know in the past, there were arguments made uh, to use these weapons. You know, it was uh, um, uh, during the Eisenhower administration, there was a desire and thankfully, they didn't, Eisenhower didn't do it, but there's a desire to use nuclear weapons to help the French in Vietnam. I mean, like there's all these different avenues that could have gone down, but thankfully have not gone down. And at this point, Kevin, where we've been, uh, you know, getting, getting close to 80 years of living with these weapons, at some point, our luck is going to run out and they could be utilized. And then that escalation occurs. And, you know, because the, the problem is, too, is that, we have our folks here who think and use terms and, and believe in things like usable nuclear weapons. Well, the Russians do as well, you know, and the Indians and the Pakistanis do as well. The Israelis certainly do. You know, again, one of their ministers just again said we should use a nuclear weapon in Gaza uh, this week. And then, uh, you know, and then you have along the Chinese who I think had a sane nuclear weapons policy for many years. You've seen that switch and you've seen the Chinese really start to build up the nuclear forces, which in most mainly because of our modernization efforts, as well as our leaving the anti-ballistic missile treaty 20 years ago. Uh, you know, there's actually this great quote from Joe Biden from 20 years ago, discussing the U.S. departure from the anti-ballistic missile treaty, which was a unilateral departure by the Bush administration, uh, where Joe Biden says, the intelligence says that, you know, this is going to cause the Chinese to triple or quadruple their nuclear weapons fleet. And you know what happened 20 years later? That's what the Chinese have done. I mean, so the dangers here, it, it's, it's not academic. And so this idea that we are that close to midnight, as the bulletin of atomic scientist says, is absolutely the case. And I uh, can't help but just mark an anniversary because I'm such a movie fan that uh, Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb is 60 years old as we're having this conversation. It was released, uh, and I'll just plug quickly that I went back and revisited what Daniel Ellsberg wrote in his book, uh, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. It was called The Doomsday Machine, mm -hmm. and how he picked apart some of the scenes and showed how starkly realistic it was in its portrayal and how uncanny uh, some of it was that they were able to get correct. Um, maybe that was owed to the sensibility, um, the, the, aware, the acute awareness of what people were walking into in that period, that Cold War era, feeling that sense of danger, that, that, that fear, that dread, I, I, not, not necessarily to get into the, the, the movie, although you, know, you could if you wanted to for a minute, but I do think it's fascinating how it was an acute sense of dread that something could happen, could go wrong right. back then. And now it's so missing. It's just, it's just, it's not even a part of life. Well, Dan, you know, who's a, a friend of both you and I, and, and uh, you know, greatly missed. Uh, he also said when they went to go see the movie, him and a colleague, I can't remember who it was, but someone also too with a big brain like Dan. Harry who, Rowan, who was, yeah. a, was, a, was a, a kind of a figure himself in foreign policy making. Right, right. And, and, uh, you know, Dan said, I didn't realize we were going to see a documentary, you know, when they walked out, you know, <laughs> I mean, so um, you know, danger. And then you have brought up and I didn't know you did this. I didn't know you did film reviews, Kevin. Uh, I don't know if you want if you want to have published, but I'm saying it. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I should have been plugging that at my movie publication. I, I did this long article and uh, I've been sharing it with my audience. But anyways, continue. Yeah. But but you wrote a review of the newest Godzilla film, Godzilla minus one. And fascinating for those of, 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 of for, for people who don't know the history of that film and how it really is an anti-nuclear story. 
that, that that's that's the story of it that's the whole meaning of it that's 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 what it symbolizes and even more fascinating then is the way the americans when the movie comes here in the 50s they do everything they can to make sure that is not what's being put out through the film and i grew up as a kid watching all those movies you know i we, all those different you know watched, watched like 25 different godzilla movies or however many I was a kid i didn't get any of that you know nothing was imbued to me i had to read about it years later oh this is about nuclear weapons oh really this is about nuclear power and the dangers of it and what we're what we're entering into so i think even in the most fictionalized setting like godzilla uh you see these 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 warnings uh, and I think oftentimes you have to go to fiction to get your point across, right? You have to go to the extremes. You have to be hyperbolic. And certainly uh, aspects of Dr. Strangelove are that, you know, uh, but yeah. you have to do that in order to make, to get people by the, by the shirt, right? And, and say, look, this is what we're talking about. That's what impresses people. That, that's what gets people to open up their minds and accept what you're saying is because you're almost shocking them into awareness, you know, whether it's through absurdity or through horror or through a, like a type of science fiction, speculative fiction that, you know, just overpowers them, you know. So, yeah, have this giant monster show up and burn Tokyo to the ground. Wow. OK. Oh, and then you make that connection and that allows people to think, well, didn't we really do that? Didn't all of Japan get burned to the ground? Didn't the American Air Force, you know, destroy 80 Japanese cities plus the two that we nuclear that we that we nuked? Wow. OK, so maybe there isn't that much of a distance here from what they're saying. And maybe, you know, the likelihood of all this is something that we should. This wasn't a one off thing, because that's the other thing that film does, I think, is film allows a continuity with the past. Film allows you to connect to other stories, other narratives, other myths, if you will, that inform us as to who we are why our society is like this and what we should be worried about, what we should be concerned about, right? So, because I think that's a danger I think we have, Kevin, is that we look at, say, Hiroshima and Nagasaki as a one-off occurrence. It, as the, at the, it, it had to be done to end World War II, one-off occurrence, Japanese empire. They had, to set, they had this emperor. They worshiped him like a god. The only way we could beat them was to drop two nuclear bombs on them. You know, that situation is never going to happen again. Every other, the rest of history is completely removed from that. History is not one continuous line or arc. You know, we have total free will here. You know, all these things we tell ourselves, you know, just as the White House is telling us about what's happening in the Red Sea and in Yemen, it's got nothing, it's not connected at all to what hap was happening in Gaza. You shouldn't at all try and look at this in the lens of other American imperial wars. Certainly don't look at this in terms of what happened over the last 10 years in Yemen, let alone the fact we've been bombing Yemen for 20 years, let alone the fact of our global war on terror or our great our greater Middle East policy or our overall global militarized foreign policy. Don't connect it to any of that. You know, I mean, that's what we're being told. Yeah, I, I want to get to these clips uh, for the last 15 minutes that I, that I talked to you here. But I do have to say that the uh, the heat ray from Godzilla, the thing that's most striking about this movie, and I, you know, I can't believe in a serious conversation that we're having that I feel like I need to get this out. But I want people to know that when I watch this on a big screen, that I really felt like I was seeing a representation of what it would be like for a nuclear bomb mm. to go off. And mm. you can't, nobody wants to see that in reality. So we need to imagine it ourselves but like the the act of this creature charging it up and then unleashing all this energy and then seeing the destruction that was wreaked it's like wow like that that's what people need to understand when we're talking about what could happen right. in the event of of a, of a nuclear weapon being detonated again that doesn't even get into the fallout of a nuclear right. winter the kind of conditions that will come after it would happen. But yeah, so thanks for engaging me on that. I want to play this clip. This is Saeed Arakat, who is a Palestinian journalist who's been in the State Department. Um, and he's been speaking. Um, let's see. Let me get this up here. So and, and in this clip, he's asking, he's asking the spokesperson about the death toll of children and how 
uh, women and children collectively have now eclipsed 15,000 in the number of deaths. And I, I just want to play his response and then take a few minutes to discuss what is, is being said here. I will say again that uh, we believe Israel has a moral and strategic imperative uh, to take all possible precautions to avoid civilian harm as it conducts this operation. Um, and I will leave it at that. Well, you know, uh, Israel has been using dumb bombs, uh, 2,000 pounds that were supplied by the United States of America. That is not exactly, you know, being surgical and so on. As long as they use this kind of munition, uh, civilians will die. I mean, day in and day out. Are you can reconcile to the fact that 150 or more Palestinian civilian men, women, and children die every day now? On the specifics of the military operations, Zaid, I'm just not going to speak to those as this is not an American operation. But uh, in every engagement that we have had with our Israeli counterparts and in every engagement we will continue to have, uh, we have reiterated the uh, moral and strategic imperative that steps need to be taken. More needs to be done to minimize the impact on civilians. But simultaneously, Said, it is also important to remember that uh, while we have this conversation, no one uh, is calling for uh, Hamas to lay down its arms. No one has been uh, condemning Hamas for uh, the irresponsible tactic that uh, no one aside from us uh, has been, has been uh, for the irresponsible tactics that Hamas has been taking to co-locate itself within civilian infrastructure. Right. It's targeting of Israeli civilians on October 7th and beyond. It's continued attacks on uh, Israel's sovereignty and its stated intent of recreating October 7th over again and again and again and again. And of course, I'd, I'm not saying that there is any moral equivalency between Hamas uh, and Israel, uh, but we'll continue to reiterate uh, again that steps need to be taken for civilian casualties to be minimized. Although it's the Israeli forces that are really now occupying Hamas and inside, I mean, occupying Gaza, uh, and inside uh, the territory, correct? That is. So, so I mean, they, they could call this off too. I mean, they could probably uh, pursue a much more, uh, a course that it might be much more successful, like negotiating with Hamas to release the hostage. And wouldn't that be uh, I'm a not, good idea of this? I'm not going to speak to the specifics surrounding the military operation. Of course, we want to see hostages released as swiftly as possible. Uh, but we also believe that it is important uh, that steps be taken to not just hold Hamas accountable, but uh, degrade it in such a way that October 7th uh, cannot be repeated. A lot going on there, but uh, your response, I mean, I think particularly what stands out to me is this insistence it's not an American operation. I couldn't help but uh, cringe when I heard him say that. It's just an alternative reality that they're, that they're existing in. And um, it is, it just shows like a, a psychopathy, a desire for a, uh, uh, you know, that proximity to power. Uh, you know, the fact that for these people in Washington, whether it's these spokespeople, whether it's for uh, people in the E ring at the Pentagon, uh, you know, the uh, certainly for those in the highest positions, whether they be members of Congress or uh, the president or the Secretary of State, it, it's about um, it's about the chair they're sitting in, or it's about the podium they're standing behind. You know, the the, the means are the ends. And, you know, certainly I don't think there's anyone we, you can point to uh, involved in this process for, on the American side who is acting in a spirit of, I really want to see peace and reconciliation achieved here. It's about what is best for my individual interests, as well as what is best for my institutional interests. And so, say, from the president's level and the, the secretary of state's level, it is what is best for me maintaining this power and what is best for my party maintaining this power and everything else then is secondary. You know, and that's, I think, how they allow themselves or how they're able to, again, contort themselves. I mean, that is just, you know, the fits and the turns and the the, the fabrications and the, the, the obfuscations and just leaving out large aspects of history and facts and reality and to say things like we are pushing for the, you know, the Israelis not to harm civilians when today 317s uh, arrived in, in, in Israel with with bombs in them, you know, every second or third day, a cargo ship. It's a good chance those cargo ships that got turned away from the Red Sea yesterday uh, were going to, I, I, I maybe I'm 
I'm speculating here because I haven't seen what their manifest was or their destination. But, you know, they could have been going to Israel. The United States has a large weapon storage facility in Diego Garcia. Uh, we used to have ships that just sat there in the Indian Ocean with weapons and munitions on them. And so it's possible that that's where those ships could have been going to. I, I don't know. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, so you have you watch this and you do it at some level, too. You wonder what type of tortured soul is able to get up there and lie the way they do? You know, what is wrong with this person? What is the psychological reason for that? Because we also have to always remember that these are individuals, you know, and the, the, the example I always think of is that, you know, General Haig, who commanded the British Expeditionary Force in the Western Front of World War One, who sent tens and tens of thousands of young men to their deaths in these like horrible, awful, stupid offensives. Uh, he used to, you know, consult seances. He used to divine spirits, right? I mean, so you have like on an individual level, individual actions like that really do matter. Even though actors like that really do matter. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is another video clip before we conclude here. And uh, this one is an ITV news journalist. So he's a, a British reporter and he's at the State Department briefing asking the same spokesperson here about video that they recorded of uh, these Palestinians that fly a white flag and then were shot at. And I just, I found this, again, another stunning illustration of what is happening with our government. You may have had the chance to see uh, some of the footage uh, shot by our cameraman in the Gaza Strip, widely shared online, showing a group of men um, waving a white flag, representing no threat whatsoever, unarmed, uh, and moving south uh, to try and reach some relatives. Um, the IDF opened fire, uh, as you can see on that video, and killed one of them, uh, Abu Salul. I wonder what your response to that is and whether you think from watching that video whether that potentially represents a war crime. Um, I have seen those, the, that footage, um, but uh, I uh, am not going to uh, comment on the specifics around that, given I'm not aware of the full circumstances on the ground. Uh, and as we've said before, this is not um, an American operation. But oh, beyond true, but that, never, nevertheless, yeah, please you're, don't. You're, you're I, I'm happy to take your questions if you'll allow me. I, if you allow me to, to answer, I don't interrupt you, and I ask you to not do the same situation. It's but not, again, it's not, it's not any a... civilian death. Uh, any civilian death is, is heartbreaking, and any uh, civilian life lost uh, is, is one too many. And we have made that clear uh, with the Israelis, and we'll continue to do so. Beyond that comment about it being heartbreaking, which is a platitude we often hear, um, are you, would you urge, uh, given that you, you support, broadly support the IDF operations in the Gaza Strip, would you support an Israeli investigation of what happened in that video? That given, is for given that they're waving a white flag and that, they represented no threat. That, that is for uh, the IDF to to undertake and determine uh, based on the circumstances of that uh, situation. What I These pictures were filmed by a cameraman working for ITV News in Gaza. As he moved forwards towards the combat zone, he noticed this group of men doing their utmost to appear non-threatening trying to proceed with care. They wanted to reach two other family members and get them out of harm's way. I had my mother and brother in there with around 50 or 70 displaced people. The Israelis came to us and told us to evacuate, but they didn't let my brother out. We want to go and try to get them, God willing. The interview complete, our cameraman walked away. And then this happened. The interviewee had been shot and fatally wounded. You can see them place their flag on his chest. As he was carried away, the white flag was turning red. Carry him. They've killed him, yells this youth. Then suddenly, more gunfire. They scream at a child telling him to find cover. 
I added the video at the end there just so it could be clear what the spokesperson was doing. Right. Right. It's again, denying reality, living in a, in a alternative reality. And you know what this says to people who are entering into government service, entering into the military, that if you want to be uh, John Kirby someday and represent the United States to the world on foreign policy issues, if you want to be Vadim Patel or Matthew Miller and, and do the same at the State Department, um, uh, Mark Ryder at the Pentagon, uh, you know, if you want people to know your names, like I know their names, right? Um, you need to go out every day and practice pissing on people's legs and telling them it's raining because that's effectively what's occurring here. Um, you know, that, you know, the idea, what they're doing is, is very obvious. These state, these spokespeople, you deny it, you say, I don't know. You say you, you offer your platitudes as was pointed out. And then you hope that the next day something else has occurred. And certainly enough is occurring for that tomorrow. There'll be something else in this incident will be forgotten. There's something about this incident, too, that that's really, uh, I think, is, is important to notice. Uh, and maybe it's because of the editing. We didn't see the camera person talking to anybody else. But the fact that it was a person being interviewed who was shot and killed, as opposed to one of the other four or five members, is really important. And that could either be just a lone Israeli soldier who said, you know what, I'm just shooting this guy because he's the one to talk to the cameraman. Or it could be uh, a policy, whether it's, it's actually definitive or just kind of exists you know, thoroughly uh, that you punish people, make an example. You see someone talking to a, a cameraman, you make an example of them. Uh, and this way we'll scare them into anyone else from talking to the press. You know, there's, so there's that, you know, but overall what you do just see is just a, a, a destruction of life that is purposeful. It's deliberate and it has a clear intent. And just like the destruction of the village, just like the destruction of buildings, the destruction of agricultural land, destruction of cemeteries, destruction of the libraries, the universities, the killing of poets and professors. I mean, the pulling down of statues, you know, this this is genocide and it's meant to do it's more than just killing of people. It's a destruction of a whole society. It's more than just making a land uninhabitable. It's erasing that a people ever lived there. Right. So what do you do? You destroy. Right. I mean, so, you know, what we're seeing here is incredibly sinister. And so that you fact that you have people who are willing to stand there and pretend that this is not happening and then offer other explanations for it or say, I don't know. You know, you have to come back to me on that one. Uh, you know, but the danger of us all, Kevin, no, leave with this, is that if Vedent Patel or whatever his name is or Matthew Miller, or whoever, they resign tomorrow. They say, I've had it. I'm not doing this. There are a thousand other people who will jump to be in that spot. There are people all throughout that building, all throughout that that State Department, who would rush to take that spot at the podium. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, so uh, I think that's something we have to grapple with. But we also have to deal. We also have to recognize that we are not going to have people ever who are going to stand in those spots and stay the truth. You know, oh, yeah. or even like even even at least, a, a, you know, what you could imagine them, to, you know, imagine if they were to say, you know, this is what we talk about when we say rules based order order. We're not talking about international law. We're talking about the rules that we create. And so we don't care that this is what Israel is doing, because this is in our what we perceive as our best interests. And so we're going to support them. Imagine how much easier it would be to engage with these people, deal with these people. You wouldn't have to suffer this dissonance, uh, this this this, you know. Uh, dissonance of, of having to listen to what they're saying. Your point about the interviewee is a good point in which to conclude because it should be mentioned, especially on my part as a journalist who thinks that there is li too little solidarity that has been shown for what has been happening against mm -hmm. journalists in Gaza. The fact that it's somewhere around 110, 120 journalists that have now been massacred many examples of deliberate targeting. Uh, you know, it is noteworthy. Uh, I'm not saying that there's anything that the British people at ITV News need to be ashamed of, but they're there and they're safe. And then they leave. And then the people they were talking to get shot, but they don't get shot at. Uh, probably because the Israeli forces don't want to deal with a dead British journalist. Well, I'm, okay. I'm pretty certain those journal uh, the, those are stringers. I'm pretty well, sure. String yeah. Okay, so maybe yeah. they are Palestinians. Yeah. Maybe they may, we we don't know their nationality. That's yeah. a good point. Thank you for raising that. I shouldn't jump to the conclusion that uh, that that they're working and have any connection to ITV as 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 British people. 
But my broader point being that they are, as you point out, they're going after people who are talking to journalists. And I think that's very deliberate that they would not want those people on the ground that are being terrorized by this genocide to talk to the press. But these, these, these people at the State Department have actually said to someone like Saeed Erekat, who was in that first clip, um, he's he said a number, he said 119 the other day, and they corrected him more like, no, it's more like 73, as if that's okay, that that that, that number is a much better figure. Right. And it's just like, every day, the mask has come off in, in, in greater ways for me. And I, I, I'll let you say anything you want in, in parting. You can tell people where to support your work as well. But, uh, but I, I thank you for uh, joining me for the hour. Yeah, thank you for having me here, Kevin. And it is important. I mean, the fact that you just, it's just not the American government, but as you were alluding to, the Western press who are ignoring this. I mean, by by any standard, what's happening to the journalists in Gaza is deliberate. I mean, there's just, and now there's there's been some reportage that, uh, I can't remember the source for this, I'm sorry, but that the Israelis were using software programs, AI programs to find the journalists. It's not that, I mean, it's not that hard to do. How hard could it be? I mean, in terms of, right? I mean, so, uh, you know, Find you know in, in the argument that well journalism particularly uh, war correspondents it's it's inherently dangerous yeah sure got it and that would that would account for I gotta imagine of the 120 journalists or so who have been killed yeah there's a chunk that died because that's the that's the nature of the job it was dangerous they were just in the bad they had about to be in the, the wrong spot wrong time so to speak but the bulk of those journalists killed because we look at other conflicts have been killed deliberately been targeted. It's just not the journalists. It's the camera people. It's the it's the uh, producers as and then as well too the families. We've seen where uh, journalist families have been targeted. I mean, a number of, of of you watch Al Jazeera and they've had a number of their people who've had their families attacked and killed by the Israelis. And it's deliberate, trying to scare these people into submission, trying to scare them, you know, as well as be a warning to others, don't speak with them. So uh, the fact that the American media and the British media and Western media haven't revolted against this, but it's the same thing as, you know, I mean, certainly something that, that uh, you know, you uh, and I have spoken about before, you were one of the best, uh, you know, in terms of the defense of, of Julian Assange, the fact that we have journalists here, bulk of the journalists in the United States, same as in Britain, who are allowing Julian Assange to be in prison, to, uh, you know, uh, denying his existence as a journalist. You know, I mean, the guy's been in the Australian journalist union for a couple decades or whatever. How How's he not a journalist? You know, but they go along with that lie. They go along with that, that alternative reality. Um, and the fact that they're not speaking up for Julian, not just for Julian's sake, but for their own sake, because of what will come from a successful extradition and a successful trial of Julian, the destruction of the First Amendment, basically, in, in many ways, uh, you know, they, they are so short term. And that's what you see with these spokespeople, like their desire to be behind the podium, behind the microphone in front of the camera, you know, and, you know, the, the, the short term, who are they as people? And that's who you have to recognize that what you're dealing with here is, is, is these are psychopaths, you know, for lack of a, a lesser term, for lack of a better term. I know if you want to uh, follow me, I'm on Twitter at Matthew Piho. Uh, my organization is the Eisenhower Media Network and also on Substack, too. Yep. And uh, we'll, I'll make sure that I get the link to people so that they can read your thoughts on foreign policy and all the stuff that you put up there. So thank you. All right. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs>